welcome to the Behavior Speak podcast. Now, here's your host, Ben Ryman. Welcome to another episode of the Behavior Speak podcast. I'm your host, Ben Ryman. Uh, today we have uh, Natasha Bouchelon on the uh, on the podcast. Uh, and uh, if that name's not familiar, uh, you'll you'll hear more soon about uh, another name she goes by and uh, and, uh, and and some of the many many cool things she does. So Natasha is a behavior analyst as well as an artist and uh this is a, an episode where we're talking about we've done a couple of these now where we're talking about folks that have combined two fields and and, and i love this this is something i i just i just think we need to see a lot more of um, um as, as so many so many folks talk about how can we sort of venture out of the autism field now natasha doesn't actually do that and we'll get into that a little more but um, but how you can kind of you know, do other things with ABA besides just sort of the, the, the strict stuff we learned in the white book and how we can kind of combine with other fields. Like I've, I've talked to, I didn't have them on the podcast, but guys like Todd Ward, who are now doing like solar consulting using ABA. I was talking to um, Brandon Green, who's doing like family re- reunification with ABA. He's talking to, oh, but he's also doing like dental x-rays how to do dental x-rays better with ABA. Uh, he, he had one on, um, on, uh, oh, what was it? It was, uh, uh, oh yeah. Teaching, teaching, teaching people how to install weather stripping into their windows using ABA. And so I just, I just really like how people uh, kind of think outside the box and Natasha is no, uh, 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 um, is no uh, exception here. Uh, combining two areas, which I think for a long time, Folks have wanted to combine. Folks have wanted to find a way to make the connection between art and ABA. And that's what we're going to kind of get into today. So thanks for being on the show today, Natasha. Yeah, thank you for having me. Maybe we could, normally we'll, we'll always, uh, kind of how we start these these episodes, we kind of get a little bit of an origin story, how folks got into to ABA. But with you, and I think other folks that maybe are combining fields, I think it's nice for folks to get a little bit of a background on on kind of both fields, and so maybe you could start. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing I could be wrong that you kind of maybe got into art before ABA. Was that right? Yes, that's correct. So yeah. maybe you could give us a little bit of a, a little bit of your origin, origin story of kind of how you got into art, and and uh, and and you know, kind of how you chose your medium, and 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 maybe you know the styles you kind of do, and those sorts of things for folks. I'm not very, and I was saying this just before we started recording. I'm not very well versed in art. I, I, I've been appreciating it more. As I've gotten older, but um, you know, there's certainly some forms of art that I, you know, you know, that you know, for example, and 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 forgive me if I, I don't mean to be insulting in any way. This is not about anything I've seen of you, but you know, that sort of really abstract stuff when folks do like three different colors on a board that <laughs> like seems like something that anyone could do. And 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 again, I, I apologize if I'm insulting anyone out there and how and how to appreciate that. I really struggled there, but certainly art like yours, which I've seen some already, you know, and it actually has some 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 connection to reality for me is is really neat to see so maybe just a little bit about how you kind of got into the art field and and kind of where you are today doing art and then we'll kind of dive into the aba side sure yeah so i come from a family of artists my mother was a painter my grandmother is a painter Uh, my grandfather's woodworker they've all been very creative and i i don't think necessarily that they were the reason that i went into it. I feel like in many ways, it must have been a genetic component of or something. Hmm. Um, I began to find an interest in the Sunday news comic section, which I don't know if kids know what that is anymore. (laughs) Yes, but Yeah, I was obsessed with uh, even at the age of five, I couldn't really read very well. Well, I could read actually. Hmm. I know I could read at that point. And I was um, following a lot of comics. Whenever I went to my grandparents' house, I'd borrow the paper. Um, and I was really inspired to start my own um, characters and, mm. and comic strip. Sometime around age nine, it developed into an interest in becoming an animator for Walt Disney Studios. I was mm. I was in love with everything Disney. Um, really, really enjoyed drawing. I was teaching myself primarily uh, how to trace and draw um, pretty regularly. And it was one of my kind of coping mechanisms when I was in school. So 
I was primarily working in dry media, um, illustrating cartoon characters and um, taking silly, making silly games with the kids at school. They would, we called it uh, WTF is this. <laughs> and we make a <laughs> scribble on a piece of paper and I would create a, a beautiful picture from it. And that was That's one of awesome. our funny, yeah, it was like an entertainment for them. And it became one of those things where like, I became kind of a little entrepreneur. So when something became popular at school, whether it was like uh, wearing sports mascots or um, something of that nature, uh, they would mm. essentially pay me to draw them a picture of it. So oh, I amazing. did that. Yeah. I, even in um, sixth grade, I created my own little business where <laughs> I was uh, drawing sports mascots for kids. And I had a little assistant who had delivered the artwork at the end of the day at the bus line. And, um, I remember my sixth grade teacher had discovered this. I was lucky the principal was out of town on vacation because huh. <laughs> they were going to, um, they were considering discipline me for, uh, uh, soliciting art. As oh a my gosh. So I think that was really funny. My sixth grade teachers let, thought it was really amusing and let me continue until the principal was back. So <laughs> that's what I did. Um, it wasn't until I think I mean, high school year, I was preparing this portfolio because I wanted to go into animation, um, a university of some sort, hmm. some kind of animation program. But uh, the beginning was to start with a graphic design degree. I, I grew up in a very really rural town, actually um, was, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Redirected, essentially, mm. away from art for a time where I was uh, a religious in religious ministry. Mm. I grew up in kind of an extremist home. That's a whole other story. That's a whole <laughs> other show. <laughs> we won't get into that. <laughs> but um so I married really young and it was after mm. that marriage and having two kids um, that I started uh, my college program in graphic design. Mm. And from there, I kind of fell into creating this, this art career that ended up being really successful. I quit college for a while and was doing that full time for the next 15 years. Wow. Um, so I, I worked as an illustrator for children's books. I created my own original work and sold that directly to collectors. I was licensing my art. Um, I was doing projects for television and stuff like that. So wow. And and you talk about in uh, in uh, your uh, your 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 starter kit. So just for folks who know what I'm talking about, we'll we'll, we'll get into that in a bit. But um, uh, you know some of your you know. There's, I mean, you mentioned RuPaul. I mean, yes. <laughs> every every time I see RuPaul, I get excited. So, um, <laughs> so what, what 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 was going on with RuPaul? Um, yeah, I worked on one of his television shows. It's called Skin Wars Fresh Paint. It was a spinoff of uh, another show that was hosted by. Um, gosh, I'm forgetting her name. She was the one of the villains in the X Men series mm. films. Um, yeah, yeah. Played Mystique. Right. So, yeah, they asked me on board to do a television show where he was the host and they took um, professional artists of different genres and styles to essentially put them through a boot camp where they mm. would learn how to body paint and then we would compete against each other. So I did their first season show and that was just one of the many things I had done. So you were, um, pa you were painting people? I was painting people. Yes. Ah, right on with your ball. That's the best. Right. Yes. On. Yeah. He's fun to work with. Totally. And so are you, are you still, I heard, I heard a lot of wuzzes in there. Are you still doing all this as far as the art side goes? Uh, unfortunately not. Uh, since I've gone to ABA, I've essentially shelved my art career. I, I mm. still paint in my spare time. I'll take on little projects here and there if I have the time, but right. I'm, I'm no longer working at, this is a full-time career. Gotcha. So, okay. Yeah. Well then the, the, the good time to sort of ask the other questions. So now how did you get into, how did you get into AB, ABA? So what was your interest there and, and kind of what led you to, uh, you know, the place you are now? Yeah. Yeah. So I, just to kind of give a background on this, my two first children, my boys were both on the spectrum. Okay. Um, it was one of the primary reasons I was able to work from home and, and tried to work from home as an artist mm. um, because my younger one was experiencing a lot of challenges. And at that time in Michigan, I think this was like 2003, 2004, we didn't have ABA. There was not access to ABA. 
I didn't know anything about ABA. Um, and when I ba- went back to school, I think it was about 2011, 2012, I decided I was going to go back, get my degree in art education so that I could use that as another avenue of, of income and do the arts like I always wanted to do. And I had this, I feel like everyone has a story, I had a Psych 101 class. Yep. And my professor had talked about working with kids on the spectrum and my jaw dropped. Number one, Mm -hmm. I was like, people do do therapy with kids on the spectrum. And number two, Mm. what is this? What is it? Is it psychology? What is this? Um, So I started digging and and doing my research and found out that there was this thing called ABA therapy. I acquired my first job as a behavior technician and I immediately fell in love with the science. Number one, I, I loved that it was creative naturally. I loved that we were working with kids in a way that incorporated play. Um, I was just blown away by the concepts of the science and I, I had to find out more. And that's just kind of where I ended up going. And I, I spent the last seven years um, in this field now. So. So, so your introduction to ABA had nothing to do with your kids. No, <laughs> it was a, it was a, it's a, you're like, you're, you're, you're like, on one hand, you got kids with, with autism that have, that have challenges. And then now from your, your psych prof, you find out about this thing called ABA for autism. Yeah. So was there a point there now? Like how old are your kids at this point when you're discovering ABA? Oh gosh. At this point, my kids were somewhere around um, 10, 11 years old right now. Mm. They're they're one's turning 18 next month. The other one's 19 right now. So they've, um, my younger one had what I'm pretty positive was, um, a pro bono free experimental ABA based, uh, therapy within Hmm. his school program. And I think that really was a key that helped him become independent as he is now. Um, they're, they're more, um, I don't want to say high functioning, but they, Mm. they are able to live independently and, and work and drive cars and all these Mm -hmm. things. So I still think that if they had had that ABA when they were earlier, they would be at a very different place than they are now, like in an even better place. So I was, I was definitely like kind of burned when I heard about this, but at the same time, we didn't have the insurance mandates until Mm -hmm. 2014. So, um, it, it, Real 2014. Wow. Yeah. See, this, this is an interesting perspective. I know this is kind of, of a side thing, but I, I'm Canadian. And so I, our perspective on, you know, ABA is quite different in certain in terms of how it's funded and kind of where it came from and all that. And, and, and there's that U S origin. And so for a lot of us, I'm sure yourself as well, uh, a lot of the, sort of the big wigs, kind of the early big wigs in ABA, you know, came out of Michigan, came out of, you know, Western Michigan university. And so a lot of folks, you know, uh, you know, I, I know Michigan maybe not be may not be the the origin per se, but it, you know, there a, a lot of you know sort of the uh, original kind of ADA research started in Michigan, and so it's interesting that on one end you've got you know Western Michigan University and all this training and all, all this stuff happening, but on the other hand, other hand, you got kids with autism that aren't getting any ABA and ABA is not even a, like, it's, it's, you know what I'm saying? There's just a sort yeah, of strange exactly. kind of time disconnect. 24 to, to hear 2014 yeah. is when, you know, kids could really start, you know, getting ABA in Michigan, you know, funded and whatnot. Right. Seems like a real, a real disconnect. And, and so I think for folks sort of outside of, especially outside of the U S you know, uh, I, I certainly had assumptions that, uh, you know, as soon as you said, you know, Michigan, I was like, oh, you got ABA really early then, but, but uh, <laughs> that's not the case. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I'm sure there were things that were available out, out there, but I, mm. I'm, I'm coming from a place where we, my income was like maybe $10,000 a year. I, I wow. grew up really poor. I married really poor. Yeah. <laughs> and so like the uphill climb to where I was, um, to where I am today, I, I probably even then wouldn't have had the uh, resources to access it. So it was a very interesting um, experience learning about this being out there, like way past the, the prime time I could have, you know, received services for my kids in some yeah. form. Yeah, for sure. Well, it sounds like, you know, overall, you you, you did a pretty good job. So, um, um, you know, uh, it's, uh, but for sure, and more, more can always be better, but um, it sounds like 
you, you did get some access to some services. Um, yeah. So that's a plus. But it, it, it's it's still kind of, you know, hard to believe that, you know, in the in sort of the early 2000s, you know, this was not that common right. you know, anywhere. Um, and, it, and it all comes down to kind of funding and those, you know, insurance, you know, related kind of lawsuits and whatnot that occurred. And, and I th- you know, I think the, the disconnect kind of between this thing that's been around for since, you know, the 60s and, you know, this intensive service for kids with autism really hasn't been around that long. Yeah. Um, so, so when, so when did art and ABA then intersect for you? Well, it was a natural move for me to try to continue to incorporate it in some way. I was kind of blown away that it wasn't really utilized in our field. Um, It would be like kind of a um, personal effort on our part to provide a a task or a program utilizing art in some form. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's, it was odd that we as, as clinicians weren't trying to kind of pave that path. There's a lot of um, interest and, proposals from analysts in our field for utilizing it in some form, researching it, applying it, but nothing there. So Mm -hmm. when I began my um, master's degree in becoming a BCBA, um, I definitely did a lot of my graduate research in reviewing the articles and looking at the literature and proposing questions Mm. of how it could be applied. And when I started my doctorate, it was originally going to be part of my dissertation. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I've done a lot of digging and into that area to figure out how it could be utilized, because I feel like number one, kids in the spectrum are either very, very creative, and it just seems like a natural tool for those who do not communicate in the ways that most typical people do. And two, it provides a completely, I think, a behavioral cusp there's an opportunity there for them to make access to all kinds of things through the art. So that's Mm why I've been so interested in finding out how to combine the two. If you're planning on collecting continuing education credits for this episode, you'll need to go to www.cbiconsultants.com forward slash shop and enter the three secret words. The first secret word is art. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Um, a lot of things I've been kind of thinking about here, and and you know, I think all your points are really good there. That you know, that that that, that you know, it seems like art, you know, particularly I think you know with children, sh- you know, should have been combined with ABA a long time ago, um, and, and yet it wasn't. And and for the longest time, and again, I don't know what it's like in the states, but for the longest time. You know, we, we've there, there's been there's been the field of art therapy, um, and uh, and I think there's been you know kind of a, a you know sort of a, a disconnect between ABA and art therapy, and, and and art therapy has often been kind of categorized along with things like you know therapeutic writing and and uh, you know sort of these other uh, you know quote unquote eclectic um, um, therapies for autism that you know, maybe may or may not have an evidence base or whatnot. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think there's always been this sort of kind of wall and I, I really feel like you're starting to kind of break that wall down. So maybe just for, for the listeners and, and for me as well, what, what, if you know, I, I'm hoping, you know, what, what is art therapy? <laughs> um, and, okay. and, and, and then, and, and then how does art therapy, you know, and, 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 and sort of is, is, is this an opportunity as, you know, I think first kind of what is it, but is this also an opportunity maybe for us as behavior analysts to maybe start collaborating with our therapists? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think based on history, the primary use of art therapy has been within the psychotherapeutic community, the cognitive therapists, the people who are working Mm. in psychoanalysis. Mm. Um, It's, it's based primary, primarily in, um, I'm trying to think Aldarian psychology, if I'm saying that correctly, um, Freudian concepts. Uh, So it's been used a lot, mainly for dealing with trauma, PTSD, um, Mm, Alzheimer's, And especially with kids on the spectrum, as far as emotional regulation, 
Um, and so it's been utilized a lot by the psychotherapy community and it's definitely been developed very well in that they've got um, credentialing systems and supervision wow. okay. um, processes and things of that nature. And, and they've also got, um, they've also identified who can identify themselves as an art therapist. There's also a movement within that realm for those who are not within psychotherapy um, who consider themselves art facilitators. And so they mm. provide art facilitation, which is to work on um, expressive communication, self-expression mm. in general. And, and so people who are social workers, um, maybe a family therapist, those types of people have been utilizing art as their modality for treatment. However, I, I don't think it is exclusive to them. It's just been, they've been the ones who have <laughs> been open to using it. And I, I think I understand why that is because a lot of what they do deals with private events, deals with things we cannot necessarily measure. Mm. And so they have been essentially spearheading that area where, whereas behavior analysts have been afraid to touch it, in my opinion, mm -hmm. because of those things. So, mm. And so in, in terms of like, like is, it, is, 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 is what you've created here, which we're going to get into in a lot more detail shortly, um, could this be an opportunity for art therapists to kind of enter our realm? I really think so. I think what I've created with um, Canvas, and I've worked very closely with Mark Dixon on this, is we've mm. found a way to utilize the technology that relational frame theory provides us in dealing with those private events. Mm. Um, also, the, the processes that are within Canvas that help us assess and analyze that child's uh, unique abilities within creativity, uh, mm -hmm. the, the observable measurable behavior, I, I've been able to create a system to help us assess and test that um, mm -hmm. in a behavior analytic way. So I, I feel like it's a nice, it could be a nice segue for those who are already working in art therapy and are considering working in ABA. I also think that it's another, it's an opportunity for us as behavior analysts to find maybe even other ways to utilize art um, mm -hmm. and ABA. Mm -hmm. Really cool. So before we kind of jump right into Canvas, and that's what we're talking about today, Canvas is Futash's uh, kind of groundbreaking new program uh, combining art and ABA, which were, which has just recently been released. And we're really going to touch on it. I wanted to just kind of touch a little bit on uh, uh, the, the research and and I was, uh, you know, I, I didn't, I, we didn't, I didn't really send you any talking points, and so I'm not going to make you break down every research article for me. Um, but um, I didn't even realize there was this much research, um, sort of in art, in, in things related to art in ABA, uh, when somehow you're just the first person here to kind of combine the two um, into into sort of a curriculum. And so, <laughs> like, this goes all the way back to Skinner. Like, what, what did what? Like, I don't think anyone knows that Skinner cared about art. Um, oh, yeah. And so what, what was Skinner's interest? And what was Skinner's kind of thoughts on art? Just kind of starting with him. Yeah. So Skinner himself was a creative. Um, if you've ever heard the stories or have, have read the books, he's been a big, big, big interest in, in writing. He had an interest mm. in writing before he moved into uh, his own graduate program and mm. went into this place where he's studying behavior analysis. Um, he gave a really big speech in the late sixties as well. Guggenheim, Guggen, Guggenheim, mm -hmm. <laughs> can't say the name, <laughs> the famous Guggenheim museum, mm. um, imploring people to really consider how important art is to the human experience. And so he was a big advocate of that. He didn't necessarily do anything in the area, obviously, um, except in a personal way. Mm -hmm. um, but we've had other behavior analysts, uh, behavior scientists in our field too, propose the importance of it from uh, a value perspective, uh, the importance of it to providing a more quality um, life experience for everyone. Um, so it's, it's a really interesting talk. You can access it online. It's available in audio and transcript. It's a really, really cool talk that he put, put on. Cool. Yeah, I, think I listened to a little bit of it. We'll we'll, uh, we'll put the link up in the show notes. The, the other area that you kind of before we'll, we'll we'll dive into the RFT piece a little more when we talk about the, the the actual program. But another area that has quite a bit of research that I, I wasn't aware of is is aesthetics. 
Um, and, and you reference um, a, a couple different folks talking about this, uh, but it seems like there's uh, it's uh, uh, is it, it looks like it's two guys that uh, either either that's a spelling mistake or we got two guys with almost <laughs> the same name, uh, <laughs> Fechner and Mechner. Um, oh, so, <laughs> okay, yeah, Fra Francis Mechner. Yeah. yeah, okay. And so what what he wrote an article which I. I printed off and I started to read. It was a 35 pager, uh, mm -hmm. which you know, which is big for, for especially for someone with a, a bit of an attention deficit like myself. But uh, <laughs> but also just a lot a lot of stuff in here that I think that it's kind of kind of you know I don't know if deep is the right word, but pretty you know pretty uh, you know thought provoking, but also you know it's a bit of a complex read um, oh yeah what 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 is what but it seems to be like a, a, a kind of a foundation and, and then there's some other folks that you know, Travis Thompson wrote writes an article about it a few years later and uh, you know so it seems to be a thing that uh, and that uh, that we're looking at quite a bit and then I saw there was a, a Marie Malott article on finger painting which I you know, <laughs> I couldn't believe. Um, so what, what is this whole idea of, of aesthetics and, and, and kind of how these folks are kind of analyzing uh, aesthetics from a behavioral perspective? Sure. So kind of a summary on Francis Mechner. He's probably one of the biggest geniuses from our field. He is, um, I don't even remember what the level of musical arts expert he is. Mm. He can play multiple instruments. Wow. He invented... I believe it was the radio wave. Um, goodness, I'm trying to remember what it's like. Yeah, yeah, no worries. <laughs> he he made inventions that we use to this day wow. involving radio waves, uh, which I didn't know about. I think it actually was, um, I'm trying to think the CBI radio or something to do with radio. Yeah, actually. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he is also a fine artist himself. He had a lot of professional application of these skills. I think he's a genius. His son was also a video game designer. He created a uh, Prince of Persia. I don't know oh, if anyone remembers yeah, that yeah, game. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So he, he is definitely multi-talented and has multi-talented, multi-talented children. Oh my goodness. I can't talk to him. <laughs> but um, his proposal in that paper, which is incredibly intense and very mm -hmm. wordy, I can agree with you on that. It's like, it really requires some deep focus to read that one mm -hmm. is he proposes we operationally define both the creation of art and mm -hmm. the experience of art mm -hmm. to determine how we can facilitate those skills, both in, in people who are dealing with those learning display de delays and challenges, but people who would benefit from those experiences. And he talks a lot about how to um, identify and apply these concepts for future research. And it's very, very fascinating. I was blown away when I found it. I had never heard about it. Mm -hmm. No one ever told me about it. I just I had come across it. And so aesthetic behavior, as he describes it, is um, both the, the synergy, which is the, um, and is very closely related to RFT, if we get into that, he describes it as the, the synthesis of concept relations and ideas into something new but also the uh, response to the art, the um, evocation of surprise or um, happiness or shock, all of those things are important to the human experience. And he identifies how to operationalize those two. So he's... yeah, that, yeah. That, and that was a piece that stood out for me was the, the, uh, the idea of a surprise reaction. Um, and then, and then he goes on to sort of, uh, and I read just a little bit here, and he kind of goes on to describe, so you've, you've seen art for the first time, and he, and he, and he equates it to sort of a bunch of different mediums. You, 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 see, you see a painting for the first time, or you hear a really good song for the first time, and there's that, you know, initial surprise kind of reaction. Um, and I think he even does some stuff with like MRI uh, imaging and whatnot when he's looking at those, sort, those sorts of pieces. But then he goes on to sort of, then he goes on to analyze. So why do we keep listening to the same song over and over again then once the surprise is gone? And he does a whole analysis of that piece. It's really fascinating. Oh, yeah, for sure. And just for, for the listeners, we'll, we'll have, we'll have you know, the, these the links to these articles in the show notes. This is not that long ago. Like Mechner was publishing this stuff in, in what, it looks like 2017, uh, 2014, yeah. uh, 2013. So this is not... I'm just surprised I haven't heard of this guy. 
Yeah. Yeah. Right. Me too. Um, so, okay. Now, now let, maybe let's get right into sort of um, um, uh, the, the Canvas program, kind of what it's all about. Um, uh, maybe so. Maybe just tell us a little bit about sort of what, uh, what, what the program is, kind of how, how you came to, to, to develop it and, and, and kind of what, what, what the current product is. Yeah, sure. So Canvas itself is a curriculum in which anyone could utilize it to either facilitate functional living skills um, they can work on commu communication and social connection, um, identifying basic concepts, making drive relational responding, all of those things. But it can also be used to facilitate an interest in the arts, which might be challenging for some of our kids on the spectrum. So it goes through the process of creative exploration, um, making contact with art materials, um, learning how to collaborate with their peers, doing group projects, um, all of those things. So it has kind of, a, I'm trying to think like a, a complicated, <laughs> complicated, complex, um, all options has complex options to how to use it. So you could use it with kids who are really young. You could use it with kids who are um, low verbal repertoires, having a hard time communicating or expressing themselves. They really need to work on expressive language. And then you can work on it with kids who are um, older, teenagers, they need, they need social skill development. They're working on more psychological flexibility. This encounters them at, at different areas and different levels. Okay. So maybe, maybe just uh, maybe an overview of kind of what the pro like what the program is. So what, what, uh, you know, uh, what are sort of the, the, the components of canvas and, you know, kind of, kind of how, how is it all implemented? Um, um, you know, what, what, what's the curriculum look like and, and sort of that, that process? Yeah. So the curriculum, it involves uh, different programs to target different areas and skill sets that need to be worked on. Um, the program provides them with a set of um, exercises that they, they can do at, in any kind of schedule that they want. Um, it has what we call flow um, lessons where they work on just the simple process of creative exploration. And then they have the full-blown art lessons called the expand lessons where we're targeting specific areas of uh, skill sets that we want to work on. And each lesson provides accommodations for the child based on their level. Um, so there's an assessment process within the book where they can mm. do direct and indirect observation, get an idea of how creative that child is and what areas are they able to um communicate something, or how creative they are in that area. It also targets their psychological flexibility. Where are they at in that? How rigid are they? How difficult is it for them to come up with the concept? It has um, some testing processes where we can gauge that. And then it has um, areas where we can calculate and measure that data to determine where they are in the process towards where we want them to be, which is in, in, in a place of creative expansion where they're able to take new concepts and expand on them, add to them, create their own new concepts to connect with other people's ideas um, and collaborate with other people. So it is, it is something that they can be used individually and both as a group. So people can implement this in social skills group time, or they can implement this at home with one child. Um, I, I hope I've developed it well enough in that they could use it anywhere that they are with, with any child. So it's, it's very versatile and it, it is complex in, in what it's offering. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I get you, I get you. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, um, so, so how does, so, so maybe just kind of walk us through how, how the whole RFT piece fits into this. Yeah. So I feel like art is a natural, um, um, tool in, in teaching drive relational responding. Um, we're, we're helping them understand concepts of, of irony, opposites, um, 
We're teaching symmetry. We're teaching diectic relations. Uh, it, it covers all the different frames of, of relational framing in, in a natural way. And so it was just a natural component to, to add to the lessons. Um, I think art is really, I'm trying to think of the word, like a perfect combination in, in teaching psychological flexibility. It's, it's a natural tool, I think, in teaching that. So how does that happen? I mean, I'm not, I'm, I am not well versed in act. I've done, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'm just in, I'm in a course right now, learning a little bit about it. And I've interviewed a few other folks that have, you know, done a good job of trying to explain kind of RFT and act to me, mm -hmm. but, um, but, but I, 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 I'm trying to understand sort of how, and maybe I think that part of this is because I'm not an artist, uh, and, and, and I haven't really experienced that piece. I mean, I play music, and so maybe I do have a connection there that I'm not really thinking of. Um, but how does how, how, how does art get me to psychological flexibility? How sure. Does, yeah. Um, it could be done unintentionally. It can be done intentionally. Um, I think unintentionally, we as as artists tend to have more natural flexibility in those areas. So we can consider a dog being blue instead of brown. We can come up with a new musical note combination after playing something someone gave to us. We're already making new relations to concepts after engaging in another one. So mm. when it comes to RFT, one of the things I love about RFT, and I, I get excited about this area when I'm working with my um, my supervisees is mm. when you are teaching a child one concept, the idea is that they will be able to make new relations based on that. Sure. And you're, you're teaching them something in a way where they're not just memorizing it. They're completely understanding that, that concept. So with canvas, with, with art in general, um, you're learning those relations very naturally. So in art, we're doing things where we're encountering um, the idea of symmetry. We're encountering the idea of opposites. We're encountering the idea of um, bigger, smaller, larger, um, <laughs> larger, smaller, faster, slower. All of those those ideas mm. that we would, mm. you know, intentionally learn with RFT. As far as ACT goes, because ACT stems from RFT mm -hmm. as you're getting into the more advanced lessons of canvas. Um, if we're working with kids where we're trying to teach them the ability to cope with things that are hard or dealing with difficult uh, situations, or we're working on them building more perspective taking, being able to understand other people's ideas and be okay with the fact that it's not their own or that it might be different or that it might be scary or that something might be um, complicated. Uh, just, just those kind of concepts. I think art is a natural tool in teaching that it's, it's naturally reinforcing to most people, of course, not everyone, but most people. And it kind of creates this, this avenue to provide that learning opportunity. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just naturally built into it. I, it's really hard to describe this when, when someone yeah. does ask me this, I really, I really struggle with explaining how it's it's just built in um no no you're doing a good job i get it i, I, <laughs> I get it I, I i i i think part of it is is you know for some for some folks like myself who haven't you know applied you know actor rft sort of uh, processes uh you know in directly in their work yet uh it, you know it, it's going to be a little bit kind of harder to grasp but i mean i th I, th I think you know you, you're you i think those those simple examples uh, of you know uh, of you know bigger smaller and 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 kind of those those different little, those different sort of initial kind of relational frames that we're trying to teach kids yeah it makes a whole lot of sense that, that how, how you can do that through art um 
I'm wondering, like, how does, how, what's a sort of like, you know, I can see some, you know, a, a kid, you know, f- who has, uh, you know, maybe already has a bit of an interest or, you know, has already started to draw a bit or is doing this and that and how this could, you know, you could really just jump right in with a kid like that and, or, or an adult for that matter and, and, and start really building this. How do you, how do you, how, how does it, what's it look like with a, a really early learner? Um, um, with no art experience, you know, the, the only thing they do, you know, with, with, with a marker. And, and, and I'm, and I say this because I, this was probably me as a kid, you know, is just, is, is, is eat it or, 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 or shove it up their <laughs> nose. These are the things I did as a kid. So I'm certainly not uh, stereotyping anybody. I, I remember doing the, I, I, I remember chewing on crayons and, and, uh, and, and, and pencil crayons. And I had, a, I think I had a little bit of pica until I was six or so, um, you know, uh, or, or some oral stimulation or whatnot, but how, how, how do you, how do, how do you start teaching a kid that has that seems to have absolutely zero interest or zero skills in art? Sure. I mean, it might be one of those things where you need to determine whether it's going to be useful for that child at this time. Mm. Um, it, it's going to be a matter of, of that, too. But if you are intending to work with someone who has no interest in art, they're very, very young. This does provide a process for them to explore the materials, just work on processes and and cause and effect play. That's gonna be the primary use for that. So it does provide that guidance in the book. It does provide um, worksheets for certain projects where the child doesn't have to create something from scratch. They're getting a guide. They've got something to help them trace things. Mm. And there's a guidance for the teachers who are going to be working um, with the kid, uh, the therapist, the BCBA, to um, facilitate the learning experience without having to go completely 100% into the, the projects. It's, it's definitely um, got that in there. So if the child isn't in, at that place, and they're not going to be for most kids, they're they're not ready to do a lot of the stuff in there until they're about age five, six, when they, even neurotypical kids aren't um, working in, in that area. So you, you, before you, before you kind of got interrupted there, you were sort of saying that, you know, kids are, it's usually kind of when kids kind of hit like five and six that they, they're kind of, you know, a little more capable of doing some of these things. What, what age range is this program meant for? They, they can be used with even a toddler, um, but I would definitely say in general, a general sense between four and five years old, they can start this program mm. um, and it can be used all the way up to, you know, um, late teens. Mm, mm. So if they want to use it with their, their 18, 18 month old client, they mm-hmm. could, mm-hmm. they could technically do that. It, it just be a very, very, very simple, simplified right. um version of the program yeah and and do you think it probably could be adapted for sort of older folks as well like for adults and whatnot absolutely I think one of the cool things about this is they could absolutely adjust the program to older clients so a lot of the uh, projects are actually kind of reverse engineered for the little ones Mm. and they're naturally more advanced um in, in terms of subject matter and theme. So some of these um, lessons involve uh, discussion and teaching, but they could be simplified for little kids. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Cause I, I just think I see there, I see a, there's some really amazing um, uh, programs that I've seen sort of for adults and kind of um, adults with you know, developmental disabilities and kind of the community living sector uh, where, where I'm from in, um, in British Columbia, uh, every year there's an annual art show uh, that's put on by a local, a local uh, developmental disability agency. And it brings in adults with developmental disabilities from all over the province um, uh, who are, you know, uh, you know, and again, uh, here's, here's some, Here's some kind of ableist bias that I have here, who you know, because uh, you know I'm f- for whatever reason surprised and amazed at, at, at the quality of the art that some of these folks are creating, um, um, and yet at the same time, you know, I think 
a lot of these folks, well, they're, you know, brilliant and amazing artists, they're still struggling in a lot of other areas, you know, a lot of other kind of skill areas. And so I could see a program like this, you know, really being adapted to someone who's already like, where, where art's already a strong reinforcer. And so I, I guess it doesn't have to be, but can, can, does, the, does the game just change all, uh, to a whole other level when you've got a kid or an adult where they're already really into art? The second secret word is Skinner. I think um, if they're already into art, they're going to definitely thrive in this program. But mm. one of the primary goals of this book is really to uh, help facilitating the, the acquisition of skills that they really need as far as communication and independent living and all that goes. So it, if they're really great at art, that's great, but they can still use um, the lessons in there to teach them um, mm -hmm. in the areas that they're showing maybe, deficits in. Maybe just for an example, because I'm trying to sort of make the, con I can totally make the connection of some of those, you know, those relational concepts and certainly those language concepts with art, because I mean, I think a lot of, and I'm not, I think of the other piece here, just to, the, for Full disclosure, um, uh, some of the audience members will know this, but I, I have almost no experience working in the early intervention realm. Um, and so I'm not familiar with some of these other sort of standard curriculums that are out there, ABLES, VB Maps, um, uh, you know, PEAK, those, these sorts of things, which I know all have, you know, um, you know, that, that are, all, are all really cool in, in different ways, but I don't know much about any of those sorts of things. So. Um, like, how do you use the, this this curriculum to teach to, to, to teach to teach like someone to brush their teeth, like a functional living skill? Oh, sorry, I my distraction with my toddler is making me say things. No worries. <laughs> don't yeah. Intentionally, me. So, uh, what I mean by not the independent living skills so much, uh, more the functional skills. So, um, if they're they're working on communicating, um, wants and oh, needs. Oh, I see. I yeah. See. I uh, gotcha, so gotcha. if we want to work on increasing manding skills, tacting skills, um, mm, learning mm. skills, it definitely, it definitely does cover those areas. No, that makes sense. And, and, and functional skills is, 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 is and that, 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 that's my bad as well. Cause we definitely, we, we look <laughs> at functional skills kind of have two different meanings. There's functional yeah. living skills, which are those adaptive skills, but then there's just, you know, the, there are those communication type skills. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, so uh, the curriculum kind of takes you through different levels. And if anyone's interested, uh, we'll, we'll send it. it it's canvasaba.com is the website. Um, uh, Natasha's just in the last couple of months has released the actual curriculum now. Um, and so there's lots of lots of information available on there. She's got a Instagram page and a Facebook page, which we'll we'll share. And she's got her own uh, pages as well, which we'll share. Um, and uh, uh, you know, and and it, and it comes with a, with a on the website. You can print off what's called the starter kit, um, uh, which uh, is essentially just a, a really nice overview of the whole program. But it also provides you know a couple of sort of example lesson plans that you might want to try out to sort of to see if, you know, this might be something you'd be interested in doing. Um, and it really takes you through it all. So I won't, uh, we won't spend a whole lot of time digging deep into that, but I'm wondering, there's a, a, a page here. Yeah, here it is. So it's, um, uh, you refer to kind of the levels of relational art skills and you can have three levels. Um, and you know, the first level is you know, zero to minor creative relation abilities, mm -hmm. uh, emergent, and then reaching adequate level. So, what if, if an individual successfully would were to go through the entire curriculum that you've created? Um, and you know, all you know, done all those act, done all those activities, and 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 you know, met met the goals, and so on and so forth. You know, and you know, kind of kind of made it to the end, as it were. What 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 would you see? Like, what would that individual now have that they didn't have three levels ago? Oh yeah. So this obviously it's super tough because art is subjective. Mm -hmm. But in, in many ways, we can find a way to identify and measure those skills. So for someone who has reached a level of creative expansion, we're 
we're looking for someone who is able to take um, create new concepts. They're, they're beyond that space where they were initially copying and imitating. Um, they're now beyond the place where they're adding to a concept. Um, they're now in a place where they're able to add incredible amount of detail. Um, they're coming up with concepts that are completely wildly new. Um, it, it would look like something completely original. And, and of course, like there are um, data sheets to, to measure those areas because it is tough. And that's where we're going to try to do some research and to, to refine this area, mm. to refine the tools we're going to use to measure this. But we are looking for um, someone is able to create um, an artwork or an idea that communicates something very meaningful. Um, it's, it's very deep. It's, <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. it's hard to describe it, but it's, no, I get it. We're, yeah, we're looking for something that isn't just a mediocre um, iteration of something they've seen or heard before. It's, mm -hmm. it's something they've completely entirely conceived from scratch. And gotcha. it's, yeah. it's definitely not something simple. Um, we're not looking at someone being able to just draw a smiley face. We're looking at someone who's created an entire picture, an entire world on it. And there's ideas and metaphorical expression. Um, there's relations they're making to um, the subject matter in their artwork. So I don't know that I don't know that that's the greatest answer. I don't you know, think that it, it is. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. And, uh, and you know, and, and uh, you know, you're 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 in, in a lot of ways. You're making me feel a little better here uh, because <laughs> uh, you're you're describing it in much better terms than I would ever be able to do. Oh, number good. One. But number two, <laughs> I think what you're also showing is, and and you're showing kind of what uh, what Mechner shows as well is that, well, not what he shows, but. Mechner, that, that Mechner paper, which I'm, which we'll put a link to, um, uh, you know, I highly recommend folks check it out if they just kind of want to, you know, you know, like, a, like, I think it would be something to post on the, the uh, behavior and philosophy Facebook page, because, you know, I think that's a place where folks would tend to maybe read it more. Um, but it, you know, it, it's a complex paper. And, and mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's doing, a, he's going through an intense process of, of really trying to kind of conceptualize and break down art and operationally define things and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, and, and, and what he's coming up with is super complex and, and really brain frying for me anyway. <laughs> yeah. um, and so if, it, if in a paper, it, I, I can't get it, you know, there, it makes perfect sense to me that you trying to sort of explain what sort of, you know, the sort of, you know, peak self-actualized, you know, um, you know, artist who's grown out of this program, what they've created, mm -hmm. you shouldn't be able to put it into words, you should be able to, you know, put it into paint, um, <laughs> um, you know, and, 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 you know, in the same way that I can't go to an art, I, I'm that guy in the art gallery that's star standing behind the two people who are having the long discussion about the the you know the three colored stripes on the on on that's that are painted on the canvas that look like a rainbow and look like something you know I could have done blindfolded but somehow this is the most amazing piece of art in the world and it's worth four hundred thousand um, yeah. dollars. Those two people can have that conversation and get it. I'm the guy <laughs> standing behind them going I don't get it. And so um, yeah you know, I. I, I you shouldn't be able to explain this to me, <laughs> um, um, you know, in, 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 unless you're some sort of art translator. And I don't even know if, if, if something like that exists. Um, does um, this seems like this 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 kind of program, though, would be really good just for sort of typical students just beginning to learn art sort of in kindergarten, grade one? Oh, yeah, definitely. And a lot of the lessons are touching on ideas from they call them the masters of art. So it's covering uh, concepts and and ideas that artists have already covered in the fine art world. Mm. Um, and and really, it's it's supposed to help cultivate this interest in art. I I think that with Canvas, what my ultimate goal is for this is number one, I want to increase the quality life of the child that gets involved in this. I want yeah. them to find joy in something that. It's outside of the repetitive, redundant, rigid um, 
activities that they might have been involved in before. I, mm-hmm. I want to see kids who get engaged in this kind of pro- this this program to find a newfound interest in expressing and communicating ideas and feelings that they have that they couldn't before. So mm-hmm. those are the main the main goals of that book. And I think that anyone neuro neurodiverse or neurotypical could use definitely use this program um, for sure. The third secret word is creative. I bet. And, 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 and there's some, there's some really inspiring stuff out there. There's, there's like, there's that fella, what's his name? Uh, Stephen Wiltshire. You know what I'm talking about? I don't. Yeah. I so, don't. <laughs> so this, this is the guy, this is the fella. Um, he's amazing. It's an autistic fella. Uh, I believe he's British, um, and he, there's there's a series of, of, of YouTube videos. I highly I'll, I'll put a link to it. I highly recommend checking it out. Where this guy, and this may start to sound familiar, but basically, this guy goes into a helicopter um, um, with with you know with someone and uh, a pilot, obviously, and uh, he he does one swoop flight over over Rome, um, so that the, the to the sky high, you know, quick, you know, 20 minute city scan of Rome. He goes back, he lands, he goes into this room. He's got uh, sheets of sheets of sort of large, I don't know how you describe the paper, but large art paper that, that are all kind of taped together, expanding across a whole ballroom. And he proceeds with a pencil to draw the entire cityscape of Rome from memory. Wow. In perfect in perfect detail, Repl- was... replicating the number of windows and buildings, the number of columns and things like the Colosseum to an exact, the little lines on the columns. Um, and, and he's now done this for like a ton of major cities around the world. Wow. Um, and, and, and it spends like four hours straight drawing these things and does it solely for the, you know, the, the, the sort of the social attention appreciation at the end. And it's just just mind blowing. And I think, you know, folks like that can be really inspiring for folks to then say, Hey, maybe, you know, you know, you know, if, if I can sort of hone, you know, my kids creative skills into a particular medium, you know, uh, this would be the go way to go. I, I would love, like, I would love to see a version of this, you know, because this, is, this makes me think of sort of, you know, when we talk about sort of the art therapy, ABA connection, you know, you know, I think the next logical step is that music therapy, ABA connection um, oh, that yeah. is that I think still hasn't really happened yet. I mean, I think I've seen I've, I've I've been looking myself and I've seen a few an article here and there that reference um, sort of music therapy combined with behavior analysis. I, I didn't actually see sort of what the results were, but but I, I could totally see you know uh, a similar program to help to help connect kids to music and help get connect kids to sort of other other kind of you know artist artistic medium sculpture um um you know and and uh you know and, and there's others i'm sure that i just can't list off right now um uh, uh, agree <laughs> oh for sure absolutely i think we got to stop being afraid of touching on these areas and trying yeah. to utilize these as as therapy in our area too you know i think there's a real uh like a, a real a bias that's, that yeah the an ableist bias that some of us have because we've sort of painted this picture of autistic folk being a hundred percent black and white concrete thinkers right um, that can't process ab- can't do the abstract can't, mm-hmm. can't be creative really you know um because it's just not in their genes and i think this has been a, you know, and I mean, I think there's 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 some initial truth to some of the black and white thing. I mean, I I, I identify a bit as neurodiverse um, uh, with with ADHD, and I I, I struggle with uh, sort of you know abstract thoughts. I'm I'm a really gullible guy. Like someone will tell me something sarcastic <laughs> or or tell me a joke, and I'll always think they mean it, and I'll always think it's real. Um, and if something says someone says something to me literally, I'll take it super literally. So I get that. I get that how that sort of somewhat natural for the brain to kind of you know have uh, process things kind of that way but but i think i think we do a real disservice by sort of um you know avoiding exposure to the arts because we just think they ain't gonna like it right 
just kind of is a really really neat program. Um, what's what sort of some of the next steps for for Canvas? Uh, you, you mentioned kind of maybe looking at doing some more research. You talked about your your working on your PhD. Is there a plan to kind of do some more research with Canvas? Maybe get some evidence to support it and and maybe experiment with some of the the pieces there. Oh yeah, I've I've been talking about it a little bit with some other. Um, people who would like to uh, implement it in their their center and help get some data on this and show if there's any adjustments on it. And I'm super open to anyone who does work on it to provide any feedback or mm. or um, data from their application to determine how we can better refine it as we go. I think Canvas is one of those programs that I'm I'm hoping will have updates and and improvements as we're getting more data on it because it's obviously it's a completely new um, path we're paving Mm -hmm. as far as using it in ABA. Um, And the next step also is to uh, develop the training, which I'm hoping is going to be out this year to help equip people who probably have never even touched art themselves who want to implement this program so that they can understand too how to navigate the process, how how to to run it in a way that facilitates those kids creative skills so it's it's a lot it's a lot (laughs) it's a long process i wish my dissertation was in this it's actually not Mm. um i'm also interested in sustainability so i've got stuff going on there cool um but after my phd i'm i'm gonna probably dive pretty much face first into doing as much as i can to research art in this area so now now this actually isn't your first venture into sort of combining aba and the art world no i uh i uh i I, these were unexpected as i was kind of looking your name up and uh, i was actually just sort of so you you had i think maybe was a was it maybe a a previous name you went by was it west coat is that right yes Uh, west coat and that's where i found a lot more of your art which is great so (laughs) folks are out there looking you can look up her name but you can also look up west coat and find lots and lots of examples of uh, of natasha's art and some of the licensing stuff and uh, it looks like there's definitely still places where one can purchase a lot of these licensed kind of things so that's, that's still a thing but um um in my search and 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 as I found kind of canvas, I also noticed that you you you've done a couple uh, you've done you put out a couple other books. Um, uh, I have. And one is called the ABA Exam Prep Coloring Book, which just again being being not an artist at all made no sense <laughs> to me whatsoever. Like what are you t- <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, how, how is how is coloring a picture going to prep me for the ABA exam? So that's my question. Yeah. How does yeah, that work? Yeah. Okay, so I, and I I have people who have questioned that, and so I've had yeah. to explain a little bit better. It's <laughs> it's not the coloring that's preparing you. Obviously, okay. it's the idea was to combine something really reinforcing and relaxing with the highly stressful preparation of study. Sure. And so it has a lot of um, it goes over uh, the the BCBA task list throughout the book. So right. you you are practicing. Um, and studying concepts, but then it provides coloring pages that go along with it. So <laughs> it's so like give, a, give me an example, like how, like if, if I'm studying, you know, well, I won't I won't come up with one because it might not be in the coloring book. So give me an example of something in the coloring book that 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 you're studying, and then you get to color. Sure. So I'll, and I'll I'll preface this with not all of it is ABA related coloring pages. It, sure. It's closely related, but some of them are very specific. So. For example, um, one of the pages is verbal behavior, and mm. you've got a coloring page of someone speaking into their ear, but you know that's not all verbal behavior. Oh, yeah, okay. So it goes over the concepts of, yeah, so it goes over all the concepts of verbal behavior, all the the things we need to study in that area, but then it provides kind of a relevant coloring page with that. And sometimes the coloring pages have the, the terms we need to know. Mm. Um, all the ABA terms are on... The coloring pages too so it's kind of like a mishmash of things it's not necessarily 100 percent. and i've i've contemplated um doing another update because this is the second version of the book mm-hmm. with very very specific coloring themes but mm-hmm. i just i don't have the time <laughs> mm-hmm. well you got you got there's a new task list out now so you got some you can you you, you can kind of a, maybe you know apply it with that in mind but yeah that would be interesting to sort of um you know uh uh combine some of those sort of um 
you know, fluency type targets, uh, oh, yeah. you know, with, with coloring and, you know, like, let, let, you know, I mean, uh, it would be really interesting actually. I, I mean, I could see some really sort of concrete examples, like sort of, um, you know, um, like stimulus fading, you know, and actually yeah. have them fade, fade their coloring as they're kind of coloring along, you know, and actually oh, yeah. do those sorts of things. So that'd be kind of fun. Yeah. Um, and then you've got another book too, um, um, where it's, it's not, directly teaching art but it's um it's you it's 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 you kind of using some of your um your uh, your previous experience as an illustrator um uh and that you've created a a a is, is it a children's book yeah, yeah yeah it's a children's book and, and, and what's that book called what's that about so that one's called i want to be a behavior analyst and it's i think the first official book out there discussing the role of a BCBA to kids. So mm. it's kind of um, these two kids go through all the different things that a BCBA can do or could do and how mm. the science might work in a very simplified way. It's, and it's an illustrated um, adventure through that. So that's great. So this just kind of complements the many books. So like, I want to be an astronaut. I want to drive a garbage truck yeah. and so on and so forth. I have the, yeah, I want to drive a garbage truck book when I was a kid and I just loved it. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, I, I could say, I, and I think this is really important uh, uh, to, to kind of have some of these things to kind of introduce it to the youth. I especially think about sort of what one kind of area that um, um, some of the, the, that my work and some of the committees I'm on are really looking at is, is, is how can we introduce, you know, how can we, how, how can we get, more diverse folks, um, you know, uh, practicing ABA and, and into the field because often access to, you know, this field is somewhat privileged. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, you know, certainly when, when it comes to sort of schooling and the exam and access to schools and, ac and, and you know, and, and even, even sort of access to employment and, and, and more so, you know, thinking of, you know, you know, uh, you know, uh, 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 children of diverse backgrounds with autism that may not autistic kids that may not have you know access to services for different reasons and so on and so forth but what happens also is then what, what we're really what, one, one of the things we're looking at is how can we encourage the younger folk like the high school kids even you know um, to get into the field and then we can you know try to you know support guide them and support them you know in whatever way we can to you know, to, to become, to become behavior, behavior analyst. So it's great to see something that it's great to see something that, ha, that, that doesn't require a kid to have a sibling with autism. Um, yeah. In order to be introduced to this kind of stuff. So I think that's pretty, that's pretty cool. Have you had yeah. a good response or? Um, I've had a pretty good response. I I'll, I'll say quite honestly, I've <laughs> had a mix. I've always had a mix and I think mm. it's just a general, um, it's a common challenge with ironically anyone in our space who puts out something to disseminate the science. There's always yep. someone critiquing it. So, I mean, it's, sure. I've got, <laughs> I've gotten some good feedback. I've gotten some not so great feedback just yep. for silly things. Like you forgot a comma lady. Uh, well, thank yes. you. I'm, I, I can't believe I forgot that comma. I hope that kid does still understands what I'm saying. Uh -huh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Like my ultimate goal and everything that, that I create and put out there is to disseminate ABA so that we get to the place where there's people that aren't like me who find it way too late in the game and, and they've got kids on the spectrum they could have found more help for. I, I hope that whatever I'm putting out in, in general is providing more um, opportunities for someone to make contact with the science totally. because it's still, it's still like the wild west. There's not enough out there. And I, I hope that more people are getting involved in, in disseminating the science in new ways. So it's just one of the ways I'm trying to do that. No, I think that's great because we're really, and I think this kind of, not only to get more kids kind of interested in the science and to be scientists and to get in the field and do all those sort of things, but there's also the other side, I think, of, of, of um, you know, trying to create more kind of acceptance of, uh, of, you know, autistic kids, too, from their peers and that sort of piece. You know, and I think this, things like this are, are, a great, are a great way of doing those sorts of things. I mean, I'm a really big fan of this whole kind of peer-mediated learning um, sort of field and, and how, you know, we, we shouldn't have paraprofessionals. Let's just let the kids be the paraprofessionals for the other kids, <laughs> yeah. you know, and there's some really good stuff there. So that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. 
One other thing I noticed just to kind of wrap up is, uh, you know, for someone who's so busy, you, you still keep seem, seeming to do more things. I, I noticed you also have a podcast. <laughs> I do. <laughs> yes. And yes. So what, what's that about? So I, um, if anyone ever does dig into like my past, aside from being in, in the arts, I was involved a lot in in podcasting in years past. So oh. I used to have two other ones um, hmm. that were geared towards artists. This one is also geared towards artists is called creative behavior. Mm. I have been like debating for a long time if I wanted to even dive into that because it's a job in itself too. Mm -hmm. I know. Um, (laughs) um, And alchemy behavior, which was my original website where I was kind of trying to combine um, creatives and BCBAs together to, Mm. to do things to disseminate the science has now become that. So that's Mm. what creative behavior is. It's, it's going to help feature people who are in our field, who are doing things that are hopefully um, innovative, things that are creative to get the science out there. But also um, I'm hoping to connect with other artists to talk about the things that they do Mm -hmm. that um, have been successful for them. So we're kind of like, it's kind of like a two for one, (laughs) two for one podcast. So scientists and artists together, hopefully. Right on. Well, that's great. And uh, uh, it, it must be tough, uh, uh, t- tough, tough with uh, uh, yeah, that, that little that little background noise we have for you, for you to do a podcast. On, 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 you must be doing them. There must be late night podcasts for you. Um, yes, yes. It's, it's just a challenge with, with the pandemic right now. There's still yeah. a lot of challenges getting child care. Absolutely. Um, so yeah. I do what I can where I can. No, 100 percent, 100 percent. Yeah, you're, it's all good. Um, yeah, well, that's great. So, uh, you know, I, I think I think this is a really nice intro. Um, kind of, I think this this you know this can really open up people's minds. You know, whether they want to you know take advantage of, of of your your Canvas curriculum, which is available now, um, or or even just uh, you know you know kind of rethink their whole approach to sort of you know you know including aspects of creativity and in, 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 in any of the teachings that they're doing um, and, and to kind of see how, you know, you know, uh, there are, there, there is a conceptual basis here. There is, you know, there is some research supporting, you know, the concepts in here. And so, you know, I think this, this can be a real eye opener for a lot of folks as a whole other kind of direction to kind of, uh, 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 to kind of take kids. So thanks for creating it. And thanks for coming on the show to talk about it. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Awesome. All right. We'll, uh, we'll talk to you again.